I'm, I'm primarily an aviation historian, so I'm going to talk about this group of women pilots who served in World War II, supported the war uh, through their work, and specifically supported the war in the Pacific as well. I, I promise that um, the rest of my slides will not have this many words, uh, right? Um, but uh, when you're talking about uh, war in society and you're talking about this, the title of my talk is The Experiment in the Cockpit, uh, because that's really what this was. This was an experiment to see if women could fly military planes. Uh, and I'm a good historian, so I always have to back up. My students in my World War II classes, I start in 1870, uh, because, you know, you've got to start early for them to really understand it. Um, right? They all roll their eyes that it's week three before we get to Pearl Harbor. So, but uh, I, I wanted to back up a little bit because this idea of putting women into military airplanes doesn't just come out of nothing. Uh, there's a long history of women in aviation in that 1930s, the, that golden age of aviation. And the lead players uh, in this story of the WASP, and they were WASP before white Anglo Saxon. Protestants that came out in the 50s, and these were in, the, you know, so they, they used to say that we were first, and then we couldn't make bumper stickers. It was very depressing to them, right? Uh, but this idea of women in aviation, and this is a photo that I found actually when I was working on the book. I'd seen versions of it all cropped, and then I got this full image from Getty. Uh, and this, of course, is Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, she's giving Jacqueline Cochran, shaking her hand, and Jackie is getting the Harmon Trophy, uh, which was for being the best aviatrix, which is female pilot, uh, of 1937. This is being awarded in 1938. And the, I put the whole caption in there because it shows some of the people that are there in the room with her. That's Alexander de Seversky, uh, who, of course, designed some incredible airplanes uh, in this time period, and his wife, and another prominent female pilot. But the one unnamed person in this picture is over Jackie Cochran's right photo, or right shoulder, and it is the one that made me shout out with glee when I really got the full version of this uh, picture, because it is Nancy Love. Uh, and Nancy Love is going to be the other woman who helps lead these women pilots. And all the books had said they didn't meet until 1942, and it's like, ha ha, they were in a room together in 1937. It's like, ha ha, you know, I, I might have sent a note with this picture to the woman who wrote uh, Nancy Love's biography and said, look what I found, but I don't know. Um, so, so this this idea of having an experiment of women in aviation and uh, seeing if they could fly military planes effectively, spoiler alert, yes, they could, um, was, was rooted in these uh, realities of women in aviation leading up to this point. It wasn't just some spontaneous decision. Uh, of course, Jackie Cochran is a very prominent woman pilot in the 1930s. She's got a long, terrific story, personal story, uh, but she was really um, very prominent. She won all sorts of awards, uh, lots of air races, flew in long-distance air races with the men, uh, the Bendix air race, others. Um, that, that I would go on, and there's a fellow in here who went to Oshkosh, and come to my Oshkosh talk, because I talk about all the air races, right? There he is. Um, but but um, she wins this award for being the outstanding uh, aviatrix again the next year in 1938. It's presented in 1939. Robert Olds is also winning these awards at the same time, so she's getting to know him. Uh, she's getting to know Eleanor Roosevelt. and. This award is presented in 39, and when September of 39 comes up and the war begins in Europe, Jackie has the nerve to write to Eleanor Roosevelt and say, hey, remember we just saw each other a few weeks ago? We should bring women in to the United States military as pilots. It takes six months to train a pilot. We're behind, and we were, right? I, I loved John's talk. It was all about how how much 1942 sucked, right? I mean, it was a horrible year, right? It was a horrible year, and, and um, this idea of how behind we were in the late 1930s, early 1940s, in aviation when it comes to pilots uh, was so true, and, 
And Jackie wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt and said, we have to use women pilots. We have to get them trained. We have to be utilizing them and thinking about how we'll utilize them. Eleanor Roosevelt gave that letter to Franklin Roosevelt and said, Frank, let's use these women pilots. And he said, nope. <laughs> right? Um, and he wasn't the first to say no, and he wasn't the last to say no. We weren't desperate enough, right? We weren't in enough trouble to be desperate enough to use women as pilots in military aviation. It just, things weren't dire enough, but we'd get there, right? Unfortunately, I didn't mean to sound excited about that, right? Uh, so another person that Jackie got to know very well was General Arnold before he was, he was fancy with all the stars. Um, of course, the backstory of um, Hap Arnold is that he was an aviation pioneer. He wasn't just there for the beginning of military aviation. He was the beginning of military aviation. He was one of the first two uh, Army pilots to get their licenses, of course, trained by the Wright brothers. Uh, and the only reason he was number two is because they trained at the same time and flipped a coin to see who would get their name written down first. Uh, so he was technically the second. But he was right there. He was an innovator. He was not quite a rule breaker, but getting right up to the edge. He was a, a, a collaborator with Billy Mitchell uh, and, and definitely wasn't afraid to push the envelope. Uh, Jackie came to uh, Arnold. She sat at a table with him at a luncheon uh, of an, another award that they'd been giving out. Uh, and this is in 1941, the summer of 1941, and says, hey, by the way, let's use women as pilots in the Army. And he said, nope. Uh, but uh, recognizing that our allies in England needed pilots, he said, how about you take a group of women over there, right? How about you first get some publicity? And so she did. She went, she flew a bomber, went up to Quebec and trained and flew a bomber across a, a Hudson, across to Europe, claimed that for the rest of her life. I was the first American woman to fly a bomber across, the only one. Um, of course, they made her sit co-pilot and they wouldn't let her land. Uh, but that's a whole nother story of Jackie drama. Uh, but but then she, while she was over there, she met Pauline Gower, and you can see, let's see, I don't know if I've got a, ooh. See, this is Jackie right here. This is Pauline Gower, who was a very prominent aviator in England, and one of the things that they did in England was they put together the Air Transport Auxiliary. Uh, this is an arm of the Royal Air Force. These are civilians. These are often people who uh, could not qualify to fly for the Royal Air Force. One of the guys had an arm missing, uh, but was a good pilot and could, could fly well enough uh, for the ATA. And the Air Transport Auxiliary moved planes, right? They ferried planes across the island. They ferried planes across the channel once we went into France. And they let women into this program in large part because uh, Pauline Gower made them. Um, but they had uh, about 1,152 pilots in the ATA, and 168 of those were women. Uh, and they had representatives from 28 different countries. So you have a lot of American men that went over and flew with the Air Transport Auxiliary uh, before the United States is in war especially. And then Jackie recruited a number of qualified American women, about 25 went over and flew. So that's Jackie. Um, this woman right here is Helen Ritchie, uh, who was the first female airline pilot in the 1930s. That's a whole other story. Uh, but Helen went over with Jackie to England. She was one of those. And I, I saw the pictures of the ships, right, and the ships all being blown out of the water and things like that. It's like. These women, these American women, left their homes and got on those boats that were being sunk, you know, all these ships being sunk, and went across to England to fly in a combat zone, essentially, uh, avoiding barrage balloons, all of that. Jackie saw the greatest advantage of this as learning from Pauline Gower. How do you organize a group of women pilots to fly in this pseudo-military environment? And, and took a lot of great lessons. Even the blue color, she claims she created the blue color of the WASP uniform, Santiago blue. But it, it really looks an awful lot like the color of the ATA's uniforms, right? So uh, Jackie or, was organizing this in the, the 1941. Uh, and then, of course, 
this happens. Uh, Pearl Harbor, a uh, horrific day uh, that changes everything for the United States. And women were in the air there too, right? Uh, this is uh, Cornelia Fort. Uh, she was a debutante from Nashville, Tennessee, who did not want to be a debutante from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and uh, her father was, uh, owned a radio station there, very prominent family, and he uh, forbade his sons from flying aircraft, right? This is the 1930s. Airplanes were very unsafe, uh, relatively. And he's like, sons, you will not fly airplanes. And Cornelia saw a loophole because <laughs> she's the daughter and promptly went out and got her pilot's license uh, and then moved to Hawaii because why not? Uh, and became a flight instructor uh, there at John Rogers Field in Honolulu. Of course, the morning of December 7th, she was in the air with a student she was flight instructing. Uh, she, I've got a little bit of her log book here. Um, the, you know, flight is interrupted by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And that's exactly what happened. She and her student were in the air over the field and all of a sudden a plane is coming straight at them. She jerks the controls away from her student. It's like, you know, is somebody drunk up here on a Sunday morning? There was an officer's club party the night before. What's going on? And then she sees those red balls on the plane and realizes they're under attack and, and watched as, as bombs dropped out of the planes into the harbor. Um, they were able to land there at the airfield, uh, running to the hangar as the Japanese are strafing the field. Her plane ends up being filled with holes. They survive. She and her students survive. Other planes uh, at the same day, Taylor Crafts and Piper Cubs, uh, did not survive. And I think that's a story of Pearl Harbor that we don't often hear, right? Uh, that there were civilians there and civilians in the air that day. So she's very motivated to do something for the war effort. She comes home uh, after several months, is able to get home, goes to Nashville where her, uh, and films a number of uh, war bond rallies, travels across the country trying to um, do something, something more for the war effort. And of course, what's going on in the United States is we're in high energy mode to train pilots. Uh, we went from uh, just over 184 men being trained in the Army Air Corps in 1937 to over 250,000 pilots who earned their wings in the U.S. Army Air Forces, right? This doesn't include Navy pilots or the Navy training that was going on. That's just the numbers in the Air Corps. Uh, so that's a lot of pilots. Uh, but it doesn't match this number, which is the number of aircraft the United States built. Uh, over the course of the war, which is over 300,000. Now, there's a problem here. If you've got 250,000 pilots and 300,000 airplanes being built in, you know, Detroit and Dallas, how do you get those planes to those points of embarkation, to put them on those boats, to take them overseas? Well, somebody has to fly them there. Somebody has to get them there. Uh, and that's where these two women come back into our story. Right. Jackie Cochran had been advocating everybody from Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Hap Arnold, we got to use women, we got to use women, we got to use women. Nancy Love is also a prominent pilot at the time. She wasn't as flashy, she didn't get the publicity, she didn't win the awards, but she was test flying. You know how all your planes uh, that you fly in airlines are tricycle landing gear, right? You don't walk up to get to your seat like this, you, you walk like this. Well, she test flew the first tricycle landing gear aircraft. She test flew the Gwyn air car, which we still don't have an air car and I'm still kind of mad about, honestly, right? But she, she did all these things and was very well respected. She and her husband had an aviation business, did charter flights, sold aircraft, and they happened to be good friends with Robert Olds. Uh, and, uh, and William Tunner, and you know, th they're looking for pilots, and, and Robert Love said, well, have you talked to Nancy? She flies to work every day. Uh, so Nancy is working to get women into the cockpit of military planes as, all, as well. Uh, and eventually it happens, right? Eventually it happens. Um, well, they do it with the help of allies. Right, they do it with the help of allies. You have a number of generals that uh, support the idea of women in aviation. 
you've got Hap Arnold, of course, who is the biggest proponent, but you've got William Tunner, the one we talked today about flying the hump. William Tunner will go on and direct the Air Transport Command's flying of the hump um, in, in Asia. Well, before he did that, he was in Wilmington uh, directing the fairing division and needing pilots. Uh, you've got uh, 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 General George, you've got uh, all these men who recognize that these women are good pilots, that they have this opportunity, and this is, this is a chance to get them in. Even George Marshall himself, right, the George Marshall, right, over everything. George Marshall got a call from Hap Arnold one Friday afternoon and said, hey, how about tomorrow morning you come, out, come over here, Jackie's going to show us uniforms. So literally, Hap Arnold and George Marshall sat while Jackie Cochran took women, and she took some, she very purposely picked some, what she would call big boned girls, uh, to try on the uniforms she didn't like and model them, <laughs> and then got a Greek model uh, to wear the uniforms she did like, and paraded those both in front of George Marshall and Hap Arnold on a Saturday morning. So she did get the uniform she liked. I wonder why. Uh, but but they, they couldn't have done this without these allies, without these, these, um, these generals uh, who were so helpful. Right? Now, throughout 1942, uh, that summer of 1942, Jackie gets her women to England in February or so of 1942. They go in several different ships, so it takes a while. Uh, and she has gotten reassurance from General Arnold that, nope, when you get back is when we'll start these women pilots. Now, Nancy Love is working with William Tunner and uh, George, and they're saying, well, why don't we do it now? And they didn't really like Jackie. And they're like, Nancy, we'd rather work with you. So while Jackie's in Europe, how about we get this started? Um, so in the summer of 1942, they were going to start it and, and worked out space for the women to be based in Wilmington with a second uh, fairing group. Uh, but then the barracks had been designed for enlisted men and didn't have proper toilet facilities. Uh, you'd be amazed how many conversations you read about toilet facilities when you read these primary sources, right? Uh, and finally, it's not until September of 1942 that they're finally able to get this pushed through. And if you get the paperback version of my book, which you're welcome to purchase if you'd like, um, uh, I talked my editor into adding a footnote about this long in the back uh, because I found the evidence that William Tunner um, and uh, George, they had gone around, General Arnold was out of town, and they went and talked somebody into signing the paperwork approving this while he was out of town because they knew he wanted Jackie to be in charge, and they wanted Nancy to be in charge. So they, and Jackie was like, they kept me in England on purpose, and everybody, including myself, for the last 50 years has been, you're crazy. They, it, but they did. They did. They totally conspired against Jackie Cochran. Uh, so in September of 1942, Nancy Love uh, sends out a group of telegrams. And this one, you can see, is addressed to Cornelia Ford. It says, the fairing division is going to start with this experiment of women pilots. And that's the language in the documents. It's an experiment to see if women can fly military planes. They didn't know if they could. They're just girls after all. And could we really do this? The women had to be between 21 and 35 years old. They had to have a commercial pilot's license. They had to have at least 500 hours of flight time. That's a lot of flight time, even today, you know, if you fly an RJ or one of the commuter planes, they've got about 1,000 hours. I don't want to talk about it or think about it, but um, 500 hours is a lot of time. And then they've got to have a 200 horsepower rating, which is a, a big horse rating. The Piper Cubs, that little blue tailor craft in the picture with Cornelia Fort, that's about 45 horsepower. Right, so they had to have a 200 horsepower rating. They had to have all those qualifications to even be considered. They had to have letters of recommendation. They had to have a high school graduation. Of course, most of them went to college. Right, just very, very overqualified. And then if you want to come and pay your own way to be interviewed in, in Newcastle, uh, then, then you can come and essentially try out for this. Of course, 
Uh, Cornelia Fort immediately jumps on it, um, as, do, as do 28 other really well-qualified women. This picture on the left, that's Nancy Love uh, on the left. Cornelia Fort is next to her. Um, the second to right with the little pillbox hat is Teresa James, who's kind of a lead through my book um, and uh, was very funny. Uh, and those are all empty suitcases. It was just a pose, just, oh, we've arrived. No, you arrived three days ago. Go get your suitcase and put on your suit uh, for the picture. Uh, but then this photo on the right is their first flight, um, and this is in the fall of 1942. And you, they, the Army Air Forces seriously was not... Um, was not certain women could fly these military planes. Uh, so they put these women with 500 hours of flight time, actually the first 13 averaged over 1,000 hours of flight time, and 200 horsepower ratings, and put them in teeny tiny light open cockpit airplanes to fly because you don't want to push it too soon. Um, so th these women are in PT-19s, uh, and, and you can see they're dressed in winter gear because they're going to go up and, and it's like driving your convertible at you know, with the window down in December, right? It, you don't do that even in Texas. Uh, and so they did this flight and then they spent um, the next six months proving that they could do it. Uh, and they, they did a great job. They didn't crash any planes. They didn't have any trouble. Uh, and so by the spring, just a few months after they had started, the Army Air Forces is like, well, this is an opportunity for publicity. This is positive publicity to show what we've done and show, show that women can do this uh, and that, that they're doing their part for the war effort. Uh, so Look Magazine has a big article on them. Of course, Look was uh, one of those big picture magazines like the old Life Magazine. It was the biggest competitor of Life magazine. Um, Getty pic, uh, came out and took photos here. Um, this is Cornelia uh, right here in the middle. There's my friend Teresa, right? Um, this is Betty Gillies, who was, um, had been president of the 99s, the Women in Aviation Organization, very prominent family, prominent pilot, all of these things. And these women went out there and said, okay, we'll fly your little airplanes, but give us a chance to do something else. And they kept pushing and they kept pushing and that was one of the great gifts Nancy Love had was if she didn't like what was going on, she'd just go and talk somebody into letting her into an airplane. So it's like, oh, we've got all these little PT-19s. Well, how about an AT-6? Let me put, let me get into one of those. Let me get into, you know, how about a P-38, for instance? Let's do this. And so these women in the fairing command, you end up with about 300 women in the fairing command. Uh, they end up being the primary pilots for these planes. So these planes that go to the Pacific, these planes that go to Europe and fight in the war have to start somewhere. And the, most of the time they were flown first by a woman because they would go to the factories and they'd say, okay, this one's done, there you go. They didn't get any special training in these planes. They would go and if they'd flown a P-47 into a factory, but the factory had a P-51 that needed to go back to the other coast, they'd say, well, go, you know, read the spec sheet, right? And, and uh, figure out how, what speed to take off and what speed to land and, and be gone with you, right? Do you get that? We got to go to war, you know? Um, and so you do. You have women flying these planes. This is Teresa um, uh, flying out of Republic Aircraft with the P-47. And they would fly them to the coasts, and they would be pickled and wrapped, in, you know, wrapped up and shipped to overseas, which is why these conversations about the losses of these ships that, that you've heard the, the fellows talk about so far today was so important because they'd be filled with these planes that were needed for the war, and, and trucks and tanks and stuff. But the airplanes were really the most important things <laughs> on these ships, clearly, besides the people, right? Besides the people, right? So they're doing all this, and they're getting a lot of good experience, and they're proving that women can do it, right? Now back up, because that's what we do as historians, right? We have to back up to be able to tell our story again. And in September of 1942, Nancy Love is in the news. She's going to have these ferry pilots. It's going to be great. Well, Jackie Cochran gets home the day the news article hits and goes into General Arnold's office and says, uh, excuse me. And he calls everybody into the room and says, Sorry, what are you guys doing? 
what, we're not having two separate women's programs. So Jackie takes all these American women who don't have enough flight time, right, who don't have 500 hours of flight time, and they start a training program. First in Houston, and we're in Texas, so I can say, have you all been to Houston? Right? It's not very good for flying. Right? It's not very good for flying. The fog rolls in, the fog rolls out, and everybody gets to go home. Uh, so they moved to Sweetwater, Texas. There was an airfield out there already uh, training uh, British pilots. They let them graduate out, and it becomes an all-female base. Uh, and they take these women, and the idea was to take them, train them, get them up to speed, f learn to fly the Army way, and then send them uh, to the Ferry Command. Uh, but uh, they ex continued the experiment. They used what put these women through the exact same training program that the men were going through, that the male cadets were going through. They had the same engineering, math, uh, Morse code was universally hated, except for one woman who would talk about how much fun it was, and they all hated her. Um, right? They would do calisthenics. They had link trainers. Uh, this is actually Hazel Ah Ying Lee, who was one of two Chinese American women who flew in the program. There were two Native American women, um, and I think three Hispanics. So I'm still trying to firm that up. And the rest were white. Um, there were black women who were qualified. I've found the name of at least six who have applied and were qualified, uh, but they, this was a segregated armed forces. Uh, and Jackie said, it's hard enough to get women to fly. We can't get black women in, in an integrated unit as well. That's a whole deeper conversation. Um, so they did the same flight training. Um, it was pretty hodgepodge at first. You can see they're wearing khakis that they got at Oshman's Sporting Goods right before graduation, right? Uh, but then they decided by the summer of 1943, they, they kind of had enough ferry pilots. They, they, things had settled down. They'd gotten it through their training cycle. And the Army Air Forces said, well, how can we expand this experiment? How can we uh, use women pilots in other ways. And Jackie raised her hand and said, we can use them any way we need to. The women, think of the women as the aerial dishwashers, right? Because dishes are something nobody likes to do, right? Nobody likes to do dishes. If you do, I live in Denton, it's not very far, right? Um, but the dishes have to be done. Right? They have to be done. They're not glamorous. Nobody gets a gold star for doing the dishes once they're past about four years old. And it, but it has to be done. And a lot of the flying that had to be done in the United States was not glamorous. Right? It was boring. It was mundane. But it had to be done. So the first thing they did with women pilots after the fairing was sent them out to Camp Davis, North Carolina, to the gunnery range. And you can see this is a tar oh, sorry. This is a, tar a target. Um, behind the plane. Um, and you have to train all those men on the ground that are going to go how to shoot at an aircraft, right? It's different from a duck. It is. Uh, and so you would have the gunners on the ground, the planes would fly in a strict pattern, and you'd have men with live ammunition firing on these planes. Uh, and you could see they would have a pilot in front and a real man in back, and he'd reel out the banner and then reel it back in. Um, and that's one of the things women did. And you can see from this, th these aren't great airplanes, right? These are quite beat up because all those shiny new ones are going to the men who are fighting in combat as, as it should have been, right? They did it in these smaller planes. They also did it in the B-17 where the women were trained as first pilots because, you know, you see all the movies, you watch Memphis Bell, all these things, and you've got the guys in the back shooting against enemy aircraft from a moving plane against a moving plane, we have to teach them how to do that. So the men would get in these planes, they'd rendezvous with another plane and a target, and they would get three shots before they were sent overseas. Isn't that nice? Uh, but they would have women as, as pilots on some of these, on some of these planes. Uh, so they did all sorts of jobs. They ferried non-flying personnel, they did um, uh, engineering test flights, which is basically after a plane's been repaired, somebody's got to test fly them, so they had the woman do that. Um, this is just a picture I like to show because these, because of the guys, right? The guys that are looking at the women over here going, 
are those girls flying planes? What's going on? Or they thought they were cute, or is Sally free for a date? The experience of these women was different on every single base. It depended on the commanding officer. It depended on the other men. But basically, they'd go in and prove that they were pilots and that they didn't want special favors, and they'd get respected by the other pilots, for the most part. Uh, if you were flying a B-17 and he was flying a PT-19, that didn't always go well because pilots are very competitive. Um, Right. Um, some women flight instructed, but not very many, um, because they were afraid that the women would embarrass the men, because flight instructing is hard if you've done it. Um, and uh, the argument Jackie made, of course, was, well, women taught men how to walk. Maybe they could teach them how to fly. <laughs> right. Uh, and then they also did uh, medical tests. Uh, which they did with men as well, right? But you have men, uh, these are women in um, an altitude chamber, right? Uh, to test, you take them up to altitude and it's, it's a good thing for pilots to do. They go up to altitude and see how stupid you are when you don't have enough oxygen. Uh, and they, but they kept track of all of this for the women and compared it to the men, right? They tried to make the women's experience as equal to the men's experience as possible. So then after the war, they could have all those reports. There's a 38-page medical report on the women Air Force Service pilots uh, comparing them. What is the best height for a pilot? What's the best weight for a pilot? How strong do they have to be for the women? How often do they have their periods, right? Does it affect their flying? How does all of that work? So it, it, it was a big part of it. Right. Uh, they also did experimental flying. Uh, one wasp flew the first American jet. Up, she was based up at Wright-Patterson, and they let her get into it. They weren't really supposed to, but they liked her, so she did. Um, and then this is a PQ-8, which is one of the first remote-controlled aircraft um, that, that we had. This is out at Biggs Field in El Paso. They're also at Liberty Field in Georgia. Uh, of course, that's going to evolve into the modern drones that we have today. Right. And then this, see how I'm bringing this back around to the Pacific War? I can do the Pacific War, right? So this is the B-29. The gentleman on the left there is Paul Tibbetts, who of course flew the Enola Gay against Hiroshima. Uh, and Paul Tibbetts had a problem. The B-29, of course, was developed by Boeing aircraft during the war, and it had some problems. The cowlings around the engines were too tight. They had a different kind of metal in there that got hot easier, uh, and the combination of the two meant a lot of engine fires. The plane got a very bad reputation, uh, and pilots were refusing to fly it. Of course, the B-29 is the most essential aircraft for the Pacific War. It's high altitude, it's long range, it can carry a lot of bombs, and it's going to weaken Tokyo like you wouldn't believe with the, the fire bombing, right, in, in 1945. Um, but if you don't have pilots to fly it, what are you going to do? Uh, so he had seen uh, this happen before with the um, B-25. And he watched Dora here, um, which is right here. He watched Dora come in and stick a tough uh, crosswind landing in an A-10. And he's like, oh, yeah, girls. And so he called over to the WASP barracks. And uh, Dee Dee Mormon on his left there answered the phone. And he said, hey. Who's that girl who flew the, the uh, just landed? And she's like, oh, that's Dora. And he's like, okay, I want Dora and you, and come on out, We're, I've got an experiment. Neither one of them had flown four engines. He took them out, and in three days, got them checked out in the B-29. Dora actually has a 12,000 horsepower rating on her license. All right, and it did actually catch on fire during her check ride, but she was cleared because, you know, she didn't crash. They it followed procedures. Um, and then they spent the next two weeks touring the United States, the bases where the B-29 was based, doing demonstration flights and showing the men that it was so easy to fly, even a girl could do it. Literally. That was, the, that was the plan. Paul Tibbetts is hilarious. These, these are not tall people, right? Dora, I knew Dora and Paul pretty well, and Dora is my size, so 5'5", five five, right? So 5'5 five five to 5'8 five range, and they're flying this plane. And, you know, Tibbetts would laugh about this. He thought it was hilarious. If, if any of you got a chance to know him, I don't know if he was here at the museum, but he was so funny, and he would, hey, 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 hey. we showed those fellas, ha, ha, ha. He just thought it was so funny that they would, they would, you know, 
But the men in the end appreciated it. I'm sure not all of them did, but, but the women got letters saying, hey, thanks for showing me that I could fly this airplane, that this was a great airplane. And spoiler alert, Dora might have married one in her 80s that she met during the war, that they got back together as friends later. Um, so, you know, women are being used in all these different ways. But the war goes on, um, and uh, this is the final statistics for these women, right? 25,000 women applied. I thought Jackie had made that number up because Jackie makes some things up sometimes. But I've seen the letters of application at the National Archives. Uh, 1,830 ended up going through the training, and 1,102 are going to wear those silver wings. Uh, that's including those initial women who were qualified and then the women who went through the training. Over the course of the war, they flew 77 types of aircraft over 60 million miles. That's all within the continental United States. Please, please don't walk out of this room thinking they flew overseas because they did not. It was just within the continental United States. But they did all these different jobs, all these different jobs. Uh, in the end, 38 women uh, were killed flying for their country. Unfortunately, one of them was Cornelia Ford. Uh, she had survived Pearl Harbor. She had gotten into the WAFs. She was so proud. She had, was based out of Long Beach uh, and had just gotten a new convertible. She was very happy with. Uh, but she was on a cross-country flight, actually in Texas, not far from Sweetwater, uh, in a BT-13 with a flight of five. And they were ch checking in with their radio to Abilene Central. Uh, Abilene Center and the fellow next to her looked down and was having trouble with his radio and got too close and his wing crushed her cockpit and she flew into the ground. Um, the woman next to her is Evelyn Sharp and she did not survive the war either. So I think it's important to remember that these women took risks and sacrificed in helping this war effort and in the work that they did uh, flying these airplanes so it could get to these men. Uh, either in support of them or to, to be flown by them uh, and to help with this overall war effort. And I will, I'm, I'm trying to time it so I can have questions. Um, Jackie and Nancy both get recognition after the war. Um, they both got the Air Medal for their service in the war. That's Jackie with General Arnold. And this is Nancy and her husband, Robert Love, who are the only couple that we know of that earned the Air Medal on the same day. We're, we're granted that on the same day. Um, the women were brought in technically as civilians. The idea was um, you'd bring them in for 90 days probation and then bring them in as second lieutenants. It gets long and complicated reason that didn't happen. Um, and uh, it was finally a vote came in Congress whether to make them part of the military or not. It came, of course, just a couple of weeks after D-Day. Uh, and everybody's like, no, we're going to win the war. And we don't need girls anymore. And so the, the women were disbanded in December of 1944, right in the middle of the Battle of Bulge. Uh, but by the 1970s, the women were in their 50s. Their kids were grown. Women, for the first time, were starting to fly military aircraft again, right, with the Army in 73, the Air Force soon after, and they realized they'd been forgotten, and the 38 who died had been forgotten. So they have this huge multi-year-long grassroots effort to gain recognition. I love having crowds that are my age-ish, right, and, and know that this is a petition, right? When you used it before change.org, we'd have paper petitions and we'd scotch tape them all together and roll them up, right? Do you guys ever do that? And they did that and um, the WASP who got the most signatures advocating for them to do it um, sat in line at this new movie called Star Wars and it had a very crowd, it's got all these things. Um, I do want to point this out. Uh, this is Bruce Arnold, who is General Arnold's son, and said he was finishing his dad's business. And this is, anyone recognize him? <laughs> Barry Goldwater. I love crowds like this, right? The father of modern conservatism, one of two United States senators to vote against the Equal Rights Amendment. He was the biggest advocate of the WASP getting recognized as veterans because he flew in the fairing division. And he said, if I'm a veteran, they're a veteran. And he is what made it happen. So in 1977, uh, they were recognized as veterans of World War II. It has been my great honor to, I got to put my picture of the book, because John did, so I get to, right? Um, 
And it, it has been my great honor and pleasure over the last 25 years to get to know these women and to be trusted with their story. And it has been a great honor today to speak with you. And I hope that you will share their story with as many people as you can. So thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions. We've got about five minutes for questions. Two questions. I want to start with the question, how did they select the few women that got checked out in the very high horsepower fast fighters like the P, um, P-51? Mm -hmm. So what was the selection criteria? That's question one. Question okay. two, can you give us a little information or just expand on the ferry flights from Buffalo, New York, in an airplane like the P-39 to Montana, mm -hmm. and they give the keys to the Russians. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the, um, the ferry pilots, the women who got into the fairing division um, were usually higher time. Um, and as the war went on, the fairing division expected the pilots to have more and more time, right? So they had to have at least 300 hours and then at least 500 hours before they were pointed to these planes. Uh, so it's going to be... Um, those initial women are all high time and, and were qualified. Then they would take women who were, um, had done well and who had more time when they joined the program, right? All the women had to have at least 35 hours by the end they had, when they came in. But some women had 200 hours to start. Then you do 300 hours in training, all of a sudden you've met that threshold. So that was part of it. Some of the women didn't want to fly P-51, and as a pilot of 152s, little Cessna 152s, like that would be very intimidating to get in a one P-51. So, so it was their qualifications and their timing um, was a lot, a lot of that. And yeah, so one of the things that these women did, and they were very proud to do, is part of that Lend-Lease program that we've talked about is you'd have these planes that were being built and then being given to the Russians. And we weren't allowed to, the WASP weren't allowed to fly it to Russia, obviously. Uh, so they would fly to Montana, and then they'd get flown up to Alaska, and the Russian pilots would get them. Sometimes women Russian pilots would get them. Uh, but that, they were a direct link to that um, part of that lend-lease of, of getting those aircraft there. Because you think about, if you think about the home front and where we were building all these planes, um, and then you've got to get them to very specific locations to get to war. Uh, that's, that's a big part of the job that needed to be done. That, the logistics of the war, the things that made the men have a better chance of surviving in combat, it's just, I think, fascinating um, how, how they were able to make it all work so carefully. But thank you for asking that question. Yeah, I was wondering if any of the women felt like they were ever unfairly scrutinized in their flying abilities, maybe by men who were looking to see them fail? Yeah, I think, um, so there are some documented cases of women, of, of some men flight instructors that, uh, you know, don't you want to have a date on, on uh, Saturday, Betty, before we do your check ride right now kind of thing. That, but. When Jackie Cochran heard about that, she used to brag about sending men to the Aleutians. That was her big thing. You mess with me or my girls, you're going to the Aleutians. Um, but, but there were definitely cases of commanding officers that didn't want the women to be on their base. And even at Camp Davis, when the women arrived, the commanding officers had had dozens of um, applications to transfer from the men. Uh, and he said, just, just let us get through this, let's, you know, let's get the women settled. And then when he finally did offer them to, um, to transfer, the men were like, no, the girls are okay. It's going to be, you know, so they just had to prove themselves. But yeah, there was definitely cases of that kind of discrimination, but they, um, they all downplayed it a lot. They didn't want to talk about that. They wanted to talk about the flying that they did and the, the work they did. They were, they were, they downplayed that as much as as they could, yeah. How much knowledge was there in the United States of other countries' utilization of female pilots? You know, I'm specifically thinking like Russia famously had mm -hmm. combat women pilots in World War II. Were we aware of that, and how did that potentially influence, I mean, some of the decisions that we made for right. this? They were definitely aware of it. How the um, full public, some, 
uh, and there were some uh, some stories in it, Life Magazine and things like that. But most of them um, didn't didn't know. But but we definitely knew, and that was. There was an opportunity for some of the women to fly to Europe, right? To fly a B-17. Actually, Nancy Love uh, trained in it, got up to Canada, and General Arnold said, "No, we are not sending women overseas. We are not sending women into these roles. We aren't that desperate." So it was a, it was, you know, we're desperate enough to let women fly, but not desperate enough to have women get killed, you know, get shot down by the Germans. Uh, they weren't going to do it, and and they didn't want to look desperate to the Germans or to the Russians or anything like that as well. So, so what was going on in the rest of the war definitely influenced how far these women were able to push, for sure. Okay, thank you very much. I don't want to step on Craig's time. Thank you.